I'm Steve Morgan, founder of Cybersecurity Ventures and editor-in-chief at Cybercrime Magazine. I'm here today with Gordon Lawson, CEO at Conceal, provider of an intelligence-grade zero-trust technology that protects global companies of all sizes from malware and ransomware. To learn more about our sponsor, Conceal, visit conceal.io. Welcome, Gordon. Great to have you on with us today. Great to be with you, Steve. Thanks. Gordon, we recently had Dr. Diane M. Janicek on with us. She spent 12 years at the National Security Agency. Let's watch a clip from her on her background. Working for the Department of Defense, and also I worked for, as you know, the White House and the Pentagon, and then ending up at the National Security Agency towards the end of my career. It is just an amazing organization because of the so many threats that we have right to our national security, our domestic security, our economic security, and being able to be in the thick of it. Um, knowing, you know, what, what the Hill might need or what um, the White House might need and be able to respond. It just, was just fabulous. And the people at the end of the day are really what keep you coming back. And then, of course, we're doing it for Americans, right? We want Americans to feel safe at home and abroad. Gordon, how important, uh, you know, is it for us to have uh, that type of uh, ex-military and, and current military uh, with us? Diane recently retired and now she's working actively in the private sector. Yeah, no, I think it's uh, essential. I mean, first of all, the mission of a national security agency is a is essential to national security, as the as the name would imply. But a lot of great patriots uh, get up every day around the world and, and support their mission. And as you know, I was also a naval officer. I was I was not assigned. I was uh, I did some work with another intelligence agency. But um, uh, there's lots of folks that have gone into industry that have served in the NSA, and I think that they make the private sector and specifically cybersecurity vendors that they go work for even stronger. So it's great to have that background. And I think it's, uh, we're lucky to have kind of national treasures like Diana working in the private sector now. So Gordon, you and I are familiar with the NSA's National Cryptologic University, but a lot of people aren't. Let's listen to what Diane had to say about that. I was so excited that the National Cryptologic University, so a little bit about the school, you have to be part of the intelligence community apparatus. You don't actually have to work for the National Security Agency, but you have to have a reason to get some of the training that we have. We teach military and civilians worldwide that work the cryptologic mission, it's the signals, signals intelligence mission, working on languages, as well as cybersecurity, just getting them up to speed. And so by the time they get done, you know, they have almost their credits already completed, so they don't have to wait to get out of the service to complete their undergraduate bachelor's, master's, and PhD. So it's a true treasure for the country is having such an amazing, qualified academic facility focused on national security training and education. So Gordon, Diane was the uh, commandant there. A lot of training going on, uh, not just the you know hands-on experience, but bringing these people through the through uh, you know a, a lot of uh, technical training. How important is that? One of the things that I think folks don't realize is the majority of people that are working in that are on active duty, military active duty, and working in intelligence community functions uh, are enlisted personnel who, you know, not are, don't necessarily have degrees when they enter the military. So having access to something uh, like National Cryptologic University allows them to upskill, kind of check that box to for that university degree, be better, probably better in their current roles, but also be better prepared for transition to civilian life. Um, so I think, and, and and once again, they're not working on open systems all the time. It's not like they could be, you know, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to be at work and I need to finish this paper. That may be impossible with the kind of work they're doing. So having that university that's flexible with their workflow and their, and their requirements in the intelligence community is, uh, is critical and, and just an, a great idea. So Diane worked underneath uh, General Nakasani. We named him the Cybersecurity Person of the Year for 2023. As uh, a lot of people in the community know, he's going to be stepping down. Well, let's hear what Diane had to say about General Nakasani. He absolutely has a love for students. He has a love for learning. When I was running the school as the commandant, the Cryptologic University, uh, we had him, we asked him to retape the introduction video for new students. And he said, what I'm going to ask every single one of you, military and civilian, it doesn't matter, you know, what age or, or background was. He said, I want you to learn something new every day, and I want you to share it with somebody else. He had a shared vision and was just very, very passionate and dedicated. And that just trickled down. And that's just what made you want to go to work every day. 
So, Gordon, in 2023, General Nakasani spoke about NSA Georgia, the Cyber Center for Excellence at Fort Gordon. Uh, that's just around the corner for Augusta University Cyber Center and the Georgia Tech Research Institute in Atlanta. So this is all local to you. And he was bl- planning to visit one or both of them. Um, how important is this connection between uh, our military and academia? Well, uh, I'm actually sitting right to the, to the left of me is the Georgia Cyber Center, which is uh, just an amazing facility here in Augusta, Georgia. Fort Gordon is now called Fort Eisenhower, and uh, it's just a, it's an incredible ecosystem for for cybersecurity and military cyber. It's not only uh, NSA South, but also the um, Army Cyber Center of Excellence is, is based at Fort Eisenhower as well. Um, but this is really like an incredible ecosystem for our country, Steve, that I think is is maybe undertapped, underlooked. And folks know about San Antonio. They know about Maryland. Of course, they know about the Bay Area. The Bay Area doesn't necessarily have, doesn't have the military connections. But I think this there's so much potential here with folks transitioning off the base. And, and you know, we'd love them to come check out Conceal and, and look, look at what's uh, to offer in the private sector. But also just the universities around here Augusta University is amazing. USC, uh, University of South Carolina and Columbia is about an hour away. There, there, there's some, a, an amazing talent pool that I think is undertapped. And you know, when I when I talk to uh, it, investors, I say, you, you all need to come visit. You need you need to see what's what's being built in Augusta because Conceal may be the first, but there's there's a lot more potential in terms of what we can build in terms of strengthening our national security and our and our cybersecurity readiness. Did you say you're right near the Georgia Cyber Center? I, I, I literally, I could, I could hit a driver from where we're sitting right now. So, uh, right around the time of the um, the ribbon cutting, we had former Governor Nathan Deal come on with us, and uh, you know, a lot of attention. You know, incredible. I, I don't know if people realize uh, just how much money went into the Georgia Cyber Center and and what's really going on there. So, so is that in Augusta? It's right in Augusta, right on the, right on the river. And so the way Augusta sits, there's the Savannah River. Augusta's on one side. North Augusta, South Carolina's on the other side. And the Georgia Cyber Center sits on the on the Georgia side, obviously. So it's exactly the reason why we're here. Uh, obviously, I love golf. And there's a, a pretty famous golf tournament here, uh, which is a whole other uh, fun fun part of living here. But we wanted to find a place that where we could bring in folks that wanted to be in the office, which is, you know, that can be hard in some geographies now. We have an incredibly vibrant workforce here that loves being in the office. Uh, we love building that that culture and camaraderie and to have the Georgia Cyber Center right next door. You know, we've done events here. We've done events. We did an event with Apple Rogers a couple of years ago for another uh, former NSA director. And so we just think this is a, uh, it's a, it's an untapped ecosystem that uh, I'm very committed to continuing to to grow and expand. Well, on the topic of uh, people and, and recruiting them, we asked Diane about women in cybersecurity. She's been an advocate. She was in a documentary that we filmed on women in cybersecurity. Uh, let's watch and listen to what she had to say. What I see now is more along the challenges of keeping women in the field. I do extensive amount of mentoring um, for folks at all ages, all genders and diversities, but primarily getting people to break into the field. And lately, it's been more to help them stay in the field. As we we all know, right, cybersecurity needs everybody. It's a team sport. We all have a role to play. And you want to be a part of it. You want to feel like you're a part of it. So as long as we can do that for the younger generation and then continue that as we go forward, that, that will be the litmus test really for success. And I hope we're at 57%. No, we only, you know, it's an amazing field for women. It's just, it's a lovely field. I, I enjoy it so much because the people are just so great. So we've asked you about this in the past, Gordon. Uh, you know, so we'll ask you again, 2024, this has been a big initiative for our industry. You know, we're moving the needle in the right direction. We're coming up on, you know, 30% of women in our field. But interestingly, and I would like to, you know, hear your thoughts on this. And we were asking uh, another CISO about this just this morning, Susan Kosky at PNC, uh, Fortune 500 financial institution. Only 15% of the Fortune 500 CISOs uh, positions are filled by women. So that's, that's a pretty big gap. We've got a lot of work to do there. And that number has held steady for about the past five years. Is there any comments from you on that? What we're going to see, I think, in the next decade or so is we've had a much more diverse military. Uh, I don't know the percentage. You all might know this better than I do, Steve. But 
there's a significant amount of Fortune 500 CISOs that had some military experience. Uh, yeah, Rich Beige, one of our advisors, great guys at AT and T now. You know, a naval officer. Um, Anthony Johnson, formerly at J.P. Morgan. All these folks had military experience. For, that's what exposed them to cyber. And so I think as we have a more diverse military, we'll see kind of that feeder in, into the private sector and moving up to these executive ranks. So I think it's a an obstacle that we're overcoming well. Uh, I look at our our uh, workforce just here at Conceal. I think we're at least 50-50. And, you know, I go back to um, you don't always have to be necessarily be a hands-on coder. You could be a sales engineer. You could be a customer success specialist. You still have to know cyber, uh, but there's so many incredible and rewarding roles to be had that uh, we also need to make sure that people know that, you know, there's there's other paths to take within our community that are that are really exciting. So Gordon, Diane, like a lot of, uh, you know, military cyber people uh, who serve our country, reach a point at the end of their careers, they transition, they come into the private sector. And when that happens, they're looking at a whole uh, new range of issues and, and they're talking about uh, things they may not have had a chance to talk about in the past. We asked Diane about the recent uh, announcements from the SEC and what that means to CISOs, what it's like to be a CISO now, and even, you know, the possibility of that scaring off people from the CISO role. What so let's watch and listen to what she had to say about that. There is a concern about the regulations in the United States that may actually impact people's desire to be collaborative and take shared responsibility. When we saw with SolarWinds being called up by name in the SEC filing, Tim Brown. And so that to me is very concerning because if they have to worry about them sending a chat message before they go on vacation that says, we hold down the fort. And the person comes back and says, hope it doesn't blow up while you're gone. And all of a sudden, it ends up at an SEC filing. I think that's 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 concerning. So the big elephant in the room for companies now is how to navigate being empowered, being collaborative, and not being fearful that you're going to be the one that's called in when something major goes wrong. So Gordon, do you share those concerns? I think so. I think that this punitive approach to CISOs is is going to backfire. This is a really daunting task. You have fiduciary duty to protect the company in these, as a, as a, I do, you know, as a CEO of a company, as a as a CISO. Uh, I'm not sure if the right word is fiduciary, but you certainly have a a very elevated responsibility to ensure that breaches don't happen. The threat vectors that we're seeing with these attacks are extremely sophisticated, and I and, and I think that you know you're at a point where it, you can't be super Superman, um, and and it's it, that there there are going to be ways that folks get through. If there's gross negligence that happened, and you know companies aren't investing in tools that are just kind of you know, standard tools that you need to have, I could I could see it there. Um, I go back to you know some of these. Let's just talk about without naming names. Some of the gaming breaches that happened, or the Fortune 100 breaches that happened. Right? We know we we all know those folks had tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars of investment, probably hundreds of millions of dollars of investment. So to hold someone accountable uh, criminally is I think uh, gonna, gonna really dissuade folks from getting into those those fields or even civilly. It's gonna be a debate that's, uh, that's ongoing here. And uh, you know, we need, to, we need to be careful of how far the government wants to go on this. They should be, they should be more collaborative and continue to help folks to ensure their fences are are secured and, and share that intelligence rather than have some fear of retribution. Well, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I think that's the consensus uh, of our industry. And I think we are going to see uh, some changes, I hope. Gordon, as always, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Steve. Pleasure with you. Appreciate it. I'm Steve Morgan, founder of Cybersecurity Ventures and editor-in-chief at Cybercrime Magazine. This interview is sponsored by Conceal, provider of an intelligence-grade zero-trust technology that protects global companies of all sizes from malware and ransomware. To learn more, visit conceal.io. You can keep up with all of our media at cybercrimemagazine.com.